please. Lights are ready. Camera's ready. Sound is ready. Action. I'm thinking high. Got my eyes. Got my eyes. She was perhaps one of the most talented entertainers in American history. She could sing, dance, act, and be very funny. From vaudeville to Broadway, then onward to Hollywood, where her career met with the ups and downs of stardom. Once one of the most well-known of comedic actresses in America to one of today's most forgotten of starlets. This is Patsy Kelly. Patsy was born Sarah Veronica Rose Kelly on January 12, 1910 to Irish immigrants John and Delia Kelly in the community of Williamsburg in New York. Patsy quickly grew to demonstrate a passion for entertaining. It was not long before Patsy's mother enrolled her daughter at the Jack Blue School of Dance in Brooklyn. There she learned to tap, soft shoe, and do all of the typical dance steps a professional dancer would need. Patsy quickly became friends with another student named Ruby Keeler. Both Ruby and Patsy would maintain a lifelong relationship that spanned stardom, Hollywood, and Broadway. Patsy was discovered by vaudevillian showman Frank Fay, who, realizing her great potential, placed her in his show and began to teach her the comedic routines popular in vaudeville. Patsy learned fast and quickly became Faye's on-stage sidekick and comic foil. Patsy would spend the next six years with Faye's group, honing her skills, talent, and timing. By 1927, Patsy departed Faye's troupe and moved on to the brighter lights of Broadway. She first appeared in Harry Delmar's Revels. The next year, she appeared in Three Cheers, and then in Earl Carroll's sketchbook in 1929. Patsy earned a reputation as a hard worker and as a reliable cast member. In that year, while the stock market crash ushered in the Great Depression, Patsy tried out for a small and unaccredited role in a silent film, The Single Man, which was filmed in New York. When Earl Carroll's sketchbook finished its run, Patsy was signed on to do Carroll's next Broadway production, Vanities. Her career on Broadway was taking off, and her small role in The Single Man had not gone unnoticed. The Brooklyn film company Vitaphone signed up Patsy to star in the new 1931 release of The Grand Dame, which then caught the attention of now legendary Hollywood producer Hal Roach. Roach created the popular comedic team of Thelma Todd and Sezu Pitts. Will you please look on me? Get off my foot! I defy Dr. Stu! Young man? Get out! Get out! Pitts was scheduled to be replaced on the team, and Roach wanted Patsy for the part. But by this time, Patsy had started in The Wonder Bar on Broadway, and was contractually bound for the duration. Roach chose to wait for her, and by the end of 1932, with her Broadway obligations concluded, Patsy was on her way to Hollywood. Hollywood, much like today, was the film mecca of the 20s and 30s. And with the recent advent of the talkies, filmmaking was bigger than ever. And while Franklin Delano Roosevelt assumed the American presidency and wrestled with the financial disaster of the Great Depression, more and more of Americans needed to escape the harsh reality of their circumstances, and they looked 
to the silver screen for relief. Hollywood's top stars were also household names. Sweet Shirley Temple, lovable Mary Pickford, darling Lillian Gish, and sexpot Jean Harlow, the swashbuckling Douglas Fairbanks, romantic Rudolph Valentino, the little tramp Charlie Chaplin, and Hollywood heartthrob Errol Flynn. These golden examples of the silver screen were the top box office draws of the day. For Patsy, her contemporaries at the Hal Roach studio would include Laurel and Hardy, Harold Lloyd, Ted Healy, and the Little Rascals, as well as her new co-star, Thelma Todd. Hal Roach wasted no time getting Patsy on set and rolling the cameras. By 1933, the new comedy team of Thelma Todd and Patsy Kelly had made four films together. Beauty and the Bus. I'm really happy to get to see here. Excuse me. What, again? And you promised me you'd be careful. I broke my promise. Asleep in the Feet. Backs to Nature, and Air Freight were all well received by moviegoers. Individually, both Thelma and Patsy were used in other films as well, and by the end of her first year in Hollywood, Patsy also appeared in Going Hollywood with Marion Davies and Bing Crosby. Sadly, in August, Patsy had joined her friend, fellow Brooklynite and female impersonator Jean Malin in Venice, California, where she and Jean, accompanied by Jean's partner Jimmy Forlenza, got into Malin's car, which was parked on the pier. Malin started the car and mistakenly put the car into reverse and drove the car backwards off the pier and into the water below. Both Patsy and Forlenza were seriously injured, and both had to be rescued from the overturned car and a near drowning death. Unfortunately, Malin was killed on impact. Although the year was a successful one for Patsy, she still wasn't so sure that Hollywood was where she wanted to be. While still recovering from her injuries, she returned briefly to New York for Malin's funeral and agreed to appear in the stage play Flying Colors at the Imperial Theater. After some coaxing from co-star Thelma Todd, Patsy returned to the West Coast. 1934 was Patsy's busiest and most successful year in Hollywood. They made ten films together that year, and separately, Patsy also made another four films for a total of 14 films in 1934.
All right, get on your mark, everybody. <laughs> Campbell, a good friendship with actress and Hollywood sex symbol Jean Harlow while on the set of The Girl from Missouri. By 1935, the comedic team of Thelma Todd and Patsy Kelly were hot box office hits. Patsy's plain looks, wisecracking comments, and brash antics played well opposite Thelma's ice cream blonde looks and fun persona. Not only had Thelma and Patsy worked well together, but they also formed a tight bond in personal friendship. Yet, although Patsy enjoyed socializing and the excitement of Hollywood nightlife, she was somewhat weary of the more faster pace of Thelma's social life and many in Thelma's circle of friends, which often included gangsters, such as Lucky Luciano and Thelma's former gangster husband, Pat DiCiccio. Although Thelma was known to frequent the Trocadero Club, Thelma also owned a nightclub of her own in Pacific Palisades. And though Todd was divorced and led a more singles lifestyle, Patsy, who was openly lesbian, was in a relationship with actress Wilma Cox, and the couple routinely preferred different social circles than did Thelma. On the heels of their 1934 successes, Thelma and Patsy embarked on a similarly busy 1935. The duo made nine pictures. Patsy would also appear separately in five other films.
In December, tragedy again affected Patsy. In mid-December, the lifeless body of Thelma Todd was discovered in a car, in a garage, behind Thelma Todd's cafe in Pacific Palisades, California. Although the reason for Todd's death was not immediately clear, rumors ranging from accidental death to suicide to murder began to circulate. Patsy was devastated by Thelma's death. Their last film together, An All-American Toothache, opened in theaters in early 1936. Together, Thelma Todd and Patsy Kelly made a total of 23 films together and earned a reputation of being the female Laurel and Hardy. Producer Hal Roach immediately set out to find a new partner for Patsy, and he took a chance on a beautiful and vivacious actress named Lita Roberti. Gee, it might be nice to see you. Yeah. You too. Roberti's <laughs> Polish accent and seeming innocence played well off of Patsy's brash wit and sharp tongue. Hey, hey, come back here. Hey, did you know you're supposed to pay your fare down below? A dime. What'd you say? I say you're supposed to pay your fare down below. Give me a dime. Oh, a dime? Oh, a dime. oh yeah. sure. Yeah, sure. Don't go away now. <laughs> I got a big surprise for you. Oh, have you? What is it? I ain't got no dime. Oh, you ain't got no dime? No. I got a big surprise for you. Why? Uh, you're going to get off the bus. Come on now. I haven't got any time hey. to put. I've got. There you are. That's for her. Uh, who's asking you to butt in? Did anybody ask you to put your two cents in this? Well, I just Why, it seems as though people can't go around. Uh. Patsy was now the top billed part of the act, and the pair made two films in early 1936, At Sea Ashore and Hill Tillies. Yet, the duo failed to claim the popularity of the Todd and Kelly pairings. Patsy appeared separately in four other films as well. Private Number, Kelly the Second, Sing Baby Sing. You see, my wife died and left me all alone in the world. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Sure, he's all right. He's oh. fine. He's wonderful. Only his leg ain't feeling so good. What's the matter with it? Not much. Just busted, that's all. What? Fine oh. thing. I take my wife to a dance and she goes around breaking people's legs. Well, I didn't do it on purpose, did I? I told you I was only showing Biff how to block. How did I know that I... 25 men on the squad and you had to pick on my best player. Why didn't you break your own leg? Or even your neck? All right, if that's how you feel about it. Then, Hal Roach wanted to experiment with a new partnering in hopes of recapturing the original Todd and Kelly magic. Actress Pert Kelton paired with Patsy in Panhandlers by the end of the year, but the pairing failed to thrill audiences. Roach then returned to Lita Roberti for two more films. In 1937, the duo made Nobody's Baby. 
<laughs> Lady, excuse me. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, uh, the man from the elevator told me to ask you, uh, to tell you, are you the one going to put me on the radio, yes? He told you to ask me about... <laughs> no, you yes. don't understand. You've got to tell uh, Lady, us... wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, you like music, sweet and hot? Sometimes... I'm over stepping with the lady. You I don't understand. Tell her! What? You tell her that the man... Never mind, never mind. Pardon me. Pick a star and had found some new success. Oh. Mr. Law, Mr. Hardy, Miss Moore, Miss Moore. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Oh, very happy. <laughs> Come on, boys, let's go. Uh, partners, oh, yes. Now, you know what you've got to do. We know it backwards. Say, do we have to do this backwards? No, no, no. Well, when am I supposed to look down? Do I come in this? Come and I'll show you something. Not me, I like it here. Oh, yes. Oh. Oh, pardon me, I want to tell you how much I enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank oh, you. you boys are great. You sure can take it, can't you? <laughs> uh, don't they hurt, those bottles? Oh, no, they're very light. Oh, you're kidding. Well, no, that's they're right. right. No, look, see? Yeah, we'll the they're what we call breakaways, yeah, see? Huh? Didn't hurt a bit, <laughs> see? Oh, you're kidding. You can't tell me that didn't hurt. Well, it what, you want to try one? Oh, really? I'd love sure. to. Yeah, let's get a bottle of you. Hey, props, bring the lady a bottle. Yes, sir. There you are. Thank you. Try it on him. Go on here. All right. Don't sure. be afraid. See? Didn't hurt a bit. Now try it on me. Oh, okay. That's the funniest. Wait. But. Things for Patsy seemed to slow a bit. Although she had made eight films in 1936, she only made a total of four films in 1937. Separately from Roberti, Patsy also appeared in Ever Since Eve. Hello, sweetie pie. Oh, it's you again. <laughs> How's my little butter boy? Jake, have you been drinking? Why? That's the first time you've kissed me since the night I held your hand while you were getting tattooed. And wake up and live. Did I bother meeting your little brother? I'm not going to marry your family. Ah, hello. Patsy! Oh, oh, all right, all right. Just a minute. Chloe, well, remember me, sis? Yeah, I remember you. I also remember that 20 bucks you borrowed from me three years ago, too. <laughs> oh, uh, meet Steve Klosky. Just call him Sunshine. Pleasure to meet you, Steve. Bye. See? Don't mind him. He's always that way. Except when he's grouchy. <laughs> Gee, sis, that was a swell plug you gave us in Winchell's column. Don't blame me. Winchell ran that himself. A joke on those agents. Come on, let's get out of here before... Unfortunately, 1937 was also another sad year for Patsy. In June... Patsy's good friend and Hollywood bombshell Jean Harlow died of complications from kidney failure at the young age of 26. Not only was Patsy devastated by the loss of her good friend, Patsy also began to wonder if she herself was a jinx. Coming to me, Kitty, I thought I could outsmart everybody, get anything I wanted. I didn't even know what I wanted. Patsy's fear of being a jinx was then strengthened in December of that same year, when friend and fellow co-star Ted Healy died from complications due to a serious and vicious beating that he suffered at the Trocadero Club at the hands of Thelma Todd's former husband and gangster, Pat DeCicio. Healy was just 41 when he died. Then, just three months later, in 1938, more bad news came to Patsy. Although plagued by serious heart ailments for most of her life, Lita Roberti had suffered a sudden and massive heart failure on March 12th of that year. Patsy had only made three films in 1938. Merrily We Live. Merrily We Live. Where's Ambrose? 
He disappeared with the silver lid. And he also took my black patent leather shoes, the ones with the taps on them. Well, I'm afraid we can't do anything about that now. We'll discuss it later. There goes my heart. Are you grouchy? Are you tired? Well, let Vibrate will fix you up. Vibrate. V I B R A T O. That's it. Vibrate. Keep right on using Vibrate. Here. When you get up in the morning, face your household duties with a smile. <laughs> and keep right on using Vibrato. Good old Vibrato. For that morning after feeling Vibrato. V I B. Oh, well, you all know how to spell And the it. cowboy and the lady with new Hollywood heartthrob, Gary Cooper. Hello. Hi. Uh, where's my wife? I guess she's upstairs. Will you tell her I'm here? I, I just got into town. I was kind of worried about her. Is she all right? Oh, yes. Uh, that, that is, I don't know. You see, she don't work here no more. Well, where'd she live? I don't know. I, I don't know either. Well, you're friends of hers, aren't you? Yeah, but Mary didn't talk much. She was very funny that way. <laughs> yeah, very funny. <laughs> uh, Oh, uh, you better go. Yeah, you better go. We'll lose our jobs if you're caught here. Well, Goodbye. Oh, you better go tell her. Producer Hal Roach made the decision to forego creating another comedic duo for Patsy. Times were changing in Hollywood, and Roach could read the signs. The popularity of comedic teams was waning, and Hollywood itself, much like the rest of the world, was changing as well. Heightened anxieties over fears of Nazi aggression in Europe and the long and continued strain of the Great Depression here in America, plus a desire for newer faces and better plot lines in cinema, caused a shift in Hollywood. Faces that had once lit up the movie screen now looked old and tired. The cookie cutter filmmaking that had fueled the machine of Tinseltown had been played out. New faces such as Maureen O'Hara, Barbara Stanwyck, Jean Arthur, and Vivian Lee, combined with leading actors such as Jimmy Stewart, Henry Fonda, and John Wayne, to reinvigorate Hollywood's available cast of stars. By the end of 1938, everything in the world was changing. 1939 is considered to be Hollywood's greatest year. Cinematic advances in sound and color, combined with more epic tales and younger, fresher faces that all thrilled audiences. While cartoon shorts and newsreel reports had replaced the comedic short films that had made Thelma Todd and Patsy Kelly, as well as Laurel and Hardy, household names. The epic musicals of Busby Berkeley and the old musical comedy features had vanished. In their place, new blockbuster films such as Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. You all think I'm licked. Well, I'm not licked. And I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause, even if this room gets filled with lies like these. And the tailors and all their armies come marching into this place. Somebody will listen to me. So. Stagecoach. You're the notorious Ringo Kid. My friends just call me Ringo. Nickname I had as a kid. And legendary epic films such as The Wizard of Oz. We're off to see the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. We hear he is the wizard of winds, if ever a wizard there was. If ever a wizard of winds there was, the Wizard of Oz is one. Because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. And Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Has the war started? took audiences by storm. In that year, Patsy appeared in only one film, The Gorilla, with the Ritz Brothers. Good night, Pop.
parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Oh, good night, good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Good night. Good night! Ah! Help! Help! Murder! Police! Her popularity had all but vanished in the firestorm of the new Hollywood productions. Patsy now found work on radio programs. <laughs> The Houghton Goodwin Spy Salon, a snitch in time, pays the rent. <laughs> What's that? A Houghton Goodwin very good at shadowing people in dark alleys? Well, I should say so. They're real slinkers. No, I said slinkers. <laughs> and by 1940, Patsy's relationship with Wilma Cox had also come to an end. Cox left the West Coast and moved back to New York. Patsy was now on her own and her career was slipping away. In 1940, Patsy appeared in only one film, The Hit Parade, and her parts in films were now mainly small and incidental supporting roles. Her days as a top-billed star were over. By 1941, Patsy had garnered a spot in four films, Roadshow, Topper Returns. I'm not mistaken. I know I'm not. I'm Mrs. Topper, aren't I, Edward? Yes, ma'am, but I don't think that's what the gentleman means. I certainly do know what I mean, don't I? Frankly, madam, I don't know. Well, who does? What do you say we start from the beginning? That's a good idea. Yeah. Where is my husband? But, madam, I don't know. This is a private home. Private? It looks more like a parade ground. Can I help you? Broadway Limited. <gasps> I got it. You get it. Where am I going to get a baby in Chicago? And what kind of a lug do you think I... Lug. Lug. I think I've got it. You know a baby? Yeah. He's six foot two. Can't use him. Quiet, please. Hello, operator. Uh, get me the Roundhouse Cafe. He's an old boyfriend of mine who works on the Pennsylvania Railroad. If he's not married or dead, he's a cinch to help us. And Playmates. Just as she was finding her new footage in a new Hollywood, disaster had struck. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Patsy appeared in only two films in 1942. Sing Your Worries Away and In Old California with John Wayne. What are you doing with my gun? Oh, I used to be a mighty pretty shot. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Any questions? By 1943, Patsy had reached rock bottom in her career. She performed in only three films in 1943. Ladies' Day, My Son the Hero. But you promised, Gertie. But look, I'm shaking to pieces and falling apart. 
Oh, what's the matter? Don't you love me anymore, kid? Well, if you put it that way. Hmm, Morgan, well. And in Patsy's last leading role, Danger, Women at Work. I ever heard that, and I've been around here a long time. You've uh, chosen a gay little partner. Oh, hardly a partner. She's gonna run this thing. Right. Women always do, but most men don't realize it. Your uh, names, please? Uh, Terry Olson. And mine's Pete Dugan. Huh? Your ages? I, uh, I'm old enough to drive a car. That's sufficient, isn't it? Well, I have to know your age. Well, I'm 33. And I'm, uh, just put down 20. Hmm. Ever been married before? Why, no. Anything else you'd like to know? Well, it's customary to ask these questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I've never done anything like this before. There you are. <clears throat> That's all there is to it. Now, see you. Two dollars, please. Two dollars? I thought a trucking license was ten dollars. Well, maybe it is, but can't you read? Sure, we can. Marriage? Wait a minute. We don't want a marriage license. You may not want it, but you've got it. And I can't take it back after it's been issued. Well, what are we going to do with it? Well, you better keep it. Looks like you might be needing it one of these days. Now, if you want a trucking license, that's window 12. Window 12? Thanks. Polite, eh? Yeah. <laughs> it was at about this time in her life that Patsy began a tumultuous, on-again, off-again relationship with actress Tallulah Bankhead. Bankhead was a self-proclaimed bisexual who preferred a more promiscuous lifestyle. Yet it seems that Patsy had fallen for Tallulah. And for the monogamous Patsy, the relationship was strained. By 1945, as the war wound down and was nearly won on all fronts, Patsy was working mostly on radio programs. Hello, Hildegard. Well, Patsy Kelly, I might have known that on a night like this you'd be here. Boy, say hello to the great comedian, Patsy Kelly. Well, hiya, fellas. Wow, 200 servicemen. That's what I call service. Patsy, remember what I told you. <laughs> we have to let that uh, uh -huh. come up. Patsy, remember what I told you. You shouldn't chase men. Oh, I'm through with that stuff, Hildegard. I'm independent now. I only chase them downhill. She then teamed up with band leader Barry Wood for their own radio program. The Paul Mollive Hour. Hello, boys. This is Patsy Kelly. Oh, and uh, thanks for voting me in this ash can in 1944. And together with Barry Wood, Patsy even recorded a record. I'm gonna hang my hat on the tree that grows in Brooklyn. I'm gonna dip my feet in Gowanus's canal. How I long for old green perch And at sight of one I'm jerked Where a feller ain't ashamed to take his gal Please watch your top coat I'm gonna hang my hat on the tree that grows in the flatbush By August of 1945, both the war in Europe and the war in the Pacific had ended and Patsy was recognized for her dedicated service to entertaining the troops at the famed Stage Door Canteen. Patsy had entertained the servicemen there more times than any other guest during the war. By late 1946, the Paul Malov Hour was canceled, and Patsy had found herself out of work. Except for a brief and mostly forgotten short film in 1947, it seemed that after 26 years in show business, Patsy's career had finally run out of gas. By 1953, the new medium of television had spread all over the United States and the world. Top stars such as Milton Berle, George Burns and Gracie Allen, Jack Benny and Sid Caesar had all made the move into the living rooms of America 
and recycled their old radio programs and old vaudeville acts for a new and fresh audience. And women such as Eve Arden, Loretta Young, and Lucille Ball had all evolved to the small screen. Forty-three-year-old Patsy Kelly was about to make the leap as well. In 1953, Patsy had appeared as a guest on the less popular game show, Anyone Can Win, and as a guest on the popular Dave Garraway show on NBC, as well as on the variety program All-Star Review, before beginning a run in the traveling play Dear Charles with girlfriend Tallulah Bankhead. Patsy described herself as not being very motivated to revive her career between 1947 and 1953. In fact, she had dedicated herself to the tumultuous relationship with Bankhead. Yet, the relationship was teetering on the brink of exhaustion, and Patsy began to look toward rejuvenating her career. By 1955, both her time with Tallulah and on stage in Dear Charles had ended. Over the next three years, Patsy appeared on both the Lux Video Theater and Craft Theater. In 1959, Patsy appeared on the television western 26 Men. The next year, her career took off. By 1960, Patsy appeared on three popular television programs, Laramie, The Untouchables, and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Patsy also made her return to the silver screen in 1960 as the housekeeper in Please Don't Eat the Daisies with David Niven and Doris Day. Don't eat the daisies, don't eat the daisies, please. How do you like it, huh? It's like a vibing hole. It's much older than that. How come it's so big? because we couldn't afford anything smaller. Come on, let's take a look around, huh? Come on. <laughs> Followed by her next appearance in the air disaster, The Crowded Sky. Mr. Bob Fairman. Oh, no. What will they think when they meet the plane? Another nut from the actor studio. Another method, Nick. Please, please, where did you get those clothes? They would make a rag picker wretch. You're to be my agent. Don't be hostile. I got my own hostilities. My hostilities have got hostilities. Actors, the way you're carrying on with all your insecurities, you had better study Zen Buddhism I'll clean your fingernails. And in 1960, she was honored with a star on the legendary Hollywood Walk of Fame. 1962 saw Patsy in two television series, Pete and Gladys with Henry Morgan and Kara Williams, and The Dick Van Dyke Show. Sympathetic person, but if a girl does something wrong, she's gotta pay for it, right? Right. right. She then followed that with an episode of Arrest and Trial and two episodes of Burke's Law in 1964. Wow, that drive shaft shall last another 20 years. Who are you? We're from the police. Your maid told us you were out here. 
Oh, I suppose they've gone and passed the law now against fixing your own machine. Oh, no, ma'am. Daddy was right. Things will never be the same. That Grover Cleveland was a radical. Patsy also appeared in the noir film The Naked Kiss. In 1966, Patsy's career picked up speed. In that year, she appeared in the film The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini and in the television programs Vacation Playhouse and the popular sci-fi western The Wild Wild West. In 1967, she appeared in the film, Come On, Let's Live a Little. Then, in the television programs, The Man from U.N.C.L.E., Laredo, and a return appearance on The Wild Wild West. By 1968, Patsy appeared in her most remembered film role as Lara Louise in Roman Polanski's Rosemary's Baby. Dear, we're not bothering you, are we? That's my dear friend, Laura Louise McBurney. He lives up on 12. Laura Louise is his guy's wife, Rosemary. Hello, Rosemary, and welcome to the brand. Hi. Laura Louise just met Guy. She wanted to meet you, too. Can we come in? Uh, of course. Yes, they are. Then, Patsy worked on two television productions. The Rosemary's Baby documentary, Mia and Roman, and the ever-popular television western series, Bonanza. Then you did not hear the shot, Mrs. Neely? Might have, might not. I was cooking. Using pine knots to get a hot fire, and everything was popping and snapping. Well, just one more question, Mrs. Neely. Uh, what time would you say it was when you discovered the body of your husband? Well, I can't say exactly, Doc, but uh, I think I can come to it through my fried chicken. I always give my chicken a good 40 to 45 minutes. Put it on about half past 11. Of course, he adjoins his court right at noon. Then it takes him 10 minutes to come home, feed his horse. Then he washes up and sits down at a quarter past. I mean, he used to. <laughs> anyway, uh, my chicken was just about done when I heard him come riding up. And uh, he didn't come in, and he didn't come in, and so I went out to see what was keeping him, and there he was. Chicken was his favorite. By 1969, as Americans were landing on the moon, Patsy appeared on the popular television series Love American Style. Oh. Oh. Just, just sit down here. Well, well, what happened? Oh, what happened? What happened? There was this noise. I went out to investigate. And right, right in the middle of my living room was a man with a flashlight. Well, I said, what are you doing with the flashlight when the light switch is over there? With that, he took the flashlight and hit me right over the head. Oh, he's not a very nice man. By 1970, she appeared on an ABC television movie of the week with Sammy Davis Jr. Then, Barefoot in the Park. And then, Patsy appeared in a campy film the Finks. In 1971, Patsy Kelly made her return to the bright lights of Broadway in the revival of No No Nanette at the 46th Street Theater in New York. Her portrayal of Pauline won her Broadway's highest honor. <laughs> The nominees for the Best Supporting Actress in the Musical are Patsy Kelly in No No Nanette, Barbara Barry in Company, and Pamela Myers also in Company. And the winner 
is Pepsi Kemmer. The nomination was enough, but this is too much. It would take me years to thank all the people who got me up to this very thrilling spot here tonight. But I would like to thank our producers, Mr. Harry Rigby, Mrs. Rubin, our dear Bert Sheveloff, and most of all, our just glorious Ruby Keeler. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. I'm going home now and faint. Goodbye. Patsy Kelly, congratulations on this Tony Award. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, when you uh, accepted it on stage, you said you thought you might go home and faint, and I just wonder if you did. I got off stage and fainted. <laughs> you see, I started at the Palace Theater when I was 10. And here I am now in the Palace Theater, and all of a sudden hit me. All I could see was Frank Fay up on stage who started me. You know, see, I started at the top, worked my way down. Between her theatrical return in 1971 and 1973 when No No Nanette finished its Broadway run, Patsy appeared on both The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and The David Frost Show. Patsy then co-starred in the ever-popular play Irene, at the Minskoff Theater, opposite Debbie Reynolds. Ah, darling, angel darling, here in me arms take rest. You were my joy, but I wanted a boy, so I settled for sex in a bed. Although Patsy didn't win, she was nominated for her second Tony Award in 1973. The nominees for Best Supporting Actress in a Musical are Patricia Elliott in A Little Night Music, Hermione Gingold in A Little Night Music, Patsy Kelly in Irene, and Irene Ryan in Pippin. When the Irene run ended, Patsy became a regular cast member on the Cop and Kid television series until its cancellation in 1976. And while the nation celebrated her American bicentennial, Patsy appeared in the popular film Freaky Friday. By 1979, Patsy appeared on the silver screen for the last time in Walt Disney's North Avenue Irregulars. And in that year, a frail and sickly looking Patsy Kelly would make her last television appearance in ABC's hit television series, I like love we know each other, okay? Hi, Mom. Hi. Oh, very nice. Nice one. Uh, uh, <laughs> my name is Paul Turner, and you're... Mabel Higgins. I'm supposed to be playing your mother. Right. right. Would you like a couple of beers? No, thank you. Some son you turned out to be. In 1980, she suffered a debilitating stroke and entered the hospital. Although she tried to rehabilitate, on September 24th of 1981, Patsy Kelly passed away. She was 71 years old. She began in vaudeville at the age of 10 and through the years appeared in nearly a dozen Broadway plays, dozens of radio broadcasts, more than 70 films, and over 30 television programs in her 61-year entertainment career. She usually played strong, confident, and mouthy characters. 
and in a time where being openly gay could land you in jail. Patsy also lived openly and defiantly as a lesbian. And yet, for many, she will always be remembered as the brash and wise cracking half of a forever popular female comedic team. of blossom on a tree. So, darling, me dear, lend your mother an ear, and you'll hear what you've been to me. Oh, you were not a very pretty baby. I recall your little eyes were cross. And in the park you yelled so loud, you always drew a crowd. And I often used to wish that you'd get lost. Oh, but I guess that I'm adjustable. My maternal instincts grew. And today, I could not do without having someone just like you about. And you can bet your life I'll never sit and stew about Another daughter just like you You wouldn't fool me mm. Another daughter just like you Sing, Sing hallelujah. hallelujah Another 